Welcome to We Choose to Thrive. This is our interview series with women who have decided to rise above the abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it was, of their past, and to live rich, full lives. We hope you will enjoy our interview series. So good morning, Winnie Anderson. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for being with me, for inviting me. I am so happy that you decided to join us on our We Choose to Thrive series. And our We Choose to Thrive is women coming together, uniting to tell our stories of resilience, of strength, of overcoming, and to give a message out to the world that no matter what we abuse, whatever hard times, whatever difficult things we've gone through, that we can rise above and we can flourish. But thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. So what prompted you to share this, your time with us and your story and join We Choose to Thrive? How long do we have? <laughs> Um, you know, I, this has been a long time coming and, and I know you know how painful this is. I do. And so I really believe that everything that happens to our life, in our life happens for a reason. And that even in the negative, that it, it's our job to then find the positive in it. I believe the universe was built in balance, so that you can't have an up without a down. You can't have a positive ex or negative experience without a positive. So I think it's our job to figure that out and make sense of it. And we're sense-making organisms, so we, we have to think through things and, and rationalize them for ourselves. And there's a great quote that I love from Mother Teresa. I'm going to try and, and get it right, but I might just be paraphrasing it. And it's that I know that God wouldn't give me anything that I can't handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. <laughs> so, so I have come to believe that part of my suffering was to make me the person that I am, but also it was to be able to support people who have also gone through this crappy stuff and who are now trying to make their own sense of it and to embrace the positive gifts that they were given as a result of this and move forward positively. Similarly to you, my focus is on business and achievement and help because you know that experiencing any kind of trauma can create conditions inside of us that cause us to actually hold ourselves back. So that's really a big part of this is to help other people not be chained by the past. Very good. So give us a little bit of a background of where that trauma was for you so that our listeners, our readers have a frame of reference. It started before birth. And I say that with confidence because my mother regularly told me, along with my siblings, that she didn't want us, that she was sorry that she had been pregnant, that she never wanted to have a child. So I really do believe that, okay, she found out she was pregnant and that she was had a lot of anger and negative emotions associated with that resentment, hatred, uh, probably self-loathing. You know, when you th I was born in 1962, so you know, and that was a time when I think the pill had really just become commonly available. But my mother was tied up in her religious beliefs, mm -hmm. so she wasn't taking the pill. They practiced the you know much maligned rhythm method, which <laughs> apparently they were off rhythm on a regular basis. So. I can really appreciate now as a 55-year-old adult woman what she was trying to say. She said it badly, but that's that's how far back my abuse goes, pre-birth. I totally agree with the pre-birth because um, I think, you know, because we are alive when we're in the womb. We're, we're, we, we take in all that and we're, mm -hmm. we're right there, you know, right. and we understand whether others can understand that or not is understanding that there's life there and our little selves know you know yeah we know from the moment we've conceived right life is energy mm -hmm. and and 
I was a, an essence of matter and energy inside of her. So to me, it would make sense that I would pick up on my cells, my energy would be feeling all of that self-loathing, hatred directed to the baby. Uh, yeah, I really do believe that. And even her own self-hatred, it, it, yeah. it becomes a very much a part of the core of who we are too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in your healing process, what was your greatest obstacle to getting over it, to, to rising above it? Um, probably people telling me to get over it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you have to process it and you know, well, I have to get over it. So you're not helping. So my biggest obstacle for a while was being re-victimized. I have have been really dealing with this heavily uh, and consciously for probably I want to say the last five or six years, maybe even seven. I mean, I you know I recognize that what happened was abuse back in the mid '80s when I was in my mid 20s. So, but I'm just I'm going to deal with that, you know. And I suppressed it and and thought that was dealing with it, which it wasn't. So when it finally became impossible for me to ignore any longer and I really started to confront it I have siblings and my siblings one still lives with my mother who was my abuser mm -hmm. the other one one of the other ones I have three siblings total but my other sister lives in a, nearby she lives like 10 or 15 minutes away from my mom and my other sister so as much as I don't care about my mom I don't want to lose my relationship with my siblings and my sisters and I had been very close I didn't want to lose that so I would go home just to see them and and to provide some kind of respite support for the sister who was still living at home and that meant being re-victimized and so that was really going back into the lion's den was really difficult once I realized what it was doing to me you know and again I'm one of these people that I'm just going to get past it um, I had to recognize that no I was being re-injured and I had to take a break I, I gave myself several months where um, I was not going to go home mm -hmm. and so one my one sister who who doesn't live at home we would secretly meet somewhere so that we would continue which you know made me feel bad because now I'm lying to my other sister but I had that was self-protection I had to do That's that to do yeah to really build up the resilience to all right I'm gonna go back in the lion's den and I also I also then had to build up the what am I gonna do because I'm sick of taking it mm -hmm. And but my focus was on protecting my sister and my relationship with her. And I knew if I went once I left, you know, she'd get it. So that was it was really a lot to try to control. I hope that makes sense. It does. So what was your biggest aha moment as far as your healing process and coming to grips with all of this? Something that that helped you to stick with this road of healing that you've been on? I hit 50 <laughs> and you know as we age that's one of the gifts that we get we go I'm not dealing with this anymore mm -hmm. and and when I recognized that this woman had stolen the first half of my life and I could continue to be the victim and let her take the rest of it or I could say I'm uh, enough done I'm done and that's really what I said was enough because and I know that that you and and the, those watching this will get this you start to think you know first of all I'm I'm gonna be the bigger person I'm not gonna be triggered by her I'm not gonna get sucked in but then at the same time you feel like I have to stand up for myself and 
then, you know, we all pussyfoot around, at least in my house, we would all pussyfoot around mom to make sure we didn't set her off. Well, she was such a lunatic that it didn't, who knew what would set her off, right? So, so obviously that wasn't working. So that was also a part of it, that I knew that I was going to protect myself, that I couldn't live for my sisters. Right. I would do the best I could for them. But I had to, that it's not selfish to protect yourself. No, it isn't. And if that meant telling my mom to shut up, to telling her that I am leaving because I'm not sitting here listening to this crap anymore, then that's what I was going to do. And that's what I did. And that's what we have to do. We have to love ourselves enough to know that and right. understand it and do something about it. Right. Because of the patterns of the past sometimes run really, really deep. And if, they do. And it's easy to, to, sometimes when we've been brought up in an abusive type of situation, we have this guilt and we have this shame, we have all these things, and we, for some reason, we feel like we have some sort of an obligation to take care of, protect, take care of that right. person, take care of everybody else in Really right. and truly, the only ones we can truly take care of is ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when we start doing it, it's really fascinating because we do start to take care of the others, but it's only by example, you know. And and yeah. taking the lead and taking the, making the example of standing for ourselves is good for them too, whether they want to see it or not. That's up to them to accept it. It's not your responsibility. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that that was a big one, you know, the all of the success gurus talk about that you have to take uh, responsibility for, you know, your thoughts, your actions. But what I had to take responsibility for was I'm not responsible. I'm not responsible for you. You know, that, <laughs> that uh, I'm not responsible for the universe. I am only responsible for what I can literally control. Right. I can't control when you're going to snap and, and uh, come out with some kind of vicious statement against me, but I can control whether I absorb that and whether I stand up for and protect myself. So that's what I actually did was recognize that I'm really only responsible for myself. You were talking to somebody else right now that is just starting down this journey of healing. What would you tell them? If they were acknowledging it, I would tell them that it will be painful, but it's worth it. And I would encourage them to get support, to find a way to uh, gather strength from others who are also going through this or dealing with it, that it's a, it's a never-ending journey. I mean, I equate it with uh, people who are alcoholics. You know, that's a lifelong day-to-day -day recovery process and staying healthy. And I think of this as the same way because... It, it's rare that it's just you and the abuser, right? There are others that are impacted, whether it's other members of the family, friends of the family, the community in general. And that's part of what I think contributes to the shame. I think also understanding how you learn and process information best and be kind to yourself. So for me, one of my escapes as a child was into a book. It was a way that I could be completely quiet and that I could literally escape into that story. So my first reaction whenever I have a problem is there must be a book that has an answer for me. So I, for me, then learning through books about what these additional symptoms were and what this ongoing process was and how to take charge of my recovery, those things were very important to me. In essence, we have, we're doing kind of rewriting our story for ourselves. Right, right. And um, there are going to be triggers. There mm -hmm. are to always going to be the triggers that the kind of, even when we feel like we've come from here to here, there's, there's, there's things in life, and that's what life is about is the triggers. But it's, but it's also acknowledging and recognizing those triggers and finding the things that work for us. Mm -hmm. And your abuse is something that we don't compare abuses. We don't, 
There's right. no yours is better, worse, mine was worse, whatever. And there's also no no one way to find healing right. and peace. Right. So so was there any books or was there yeah. any particular people that you really, really resonated with that you might want to share with some of this? First of all, Brene Brown's work. Oh. You know, of course, it's wonderful. And it was really her first TED Talk that is is part of what really propelled me to recognize that I actually, I'd done some work with coaches around symptomatic things, and it just wasn't helping me. And it was watching that video of that original TED Talk that talked about vulnerability and that sort of thing, and then watching her extended interview with Oprah on uh, on her program online it was I think it's called Super Soul Sunday or something like that and it was watching those two things that made me say you know what I need therapy I need to work with a person who is trained in and and has a concentrated focus in helping me so I watched those videos I then bought some books that I found and I ended up actually reaching out to the person who wrote them and just prayed that she would that I would be able to afford her and I did so I was able to work directly with her so I the the original book that I read by her is called healing your emotional self that was really powerful for me and in reading some other things and learning about the author herself her name's Beverly Angle I then felt that she would be a good fit for me. She had some, uh, you know, she has an abuse story, and I felt good. And she'd been on Oprah herself, so I felt like this would be a good fit for me. Then the other thing that um, was a big help to me, there's a workbook called Survivor to Thriver, and it is created by, or was created by, I think it's called the Morris Center. And the website is ASCASupport.org, and it's a free download. So that book helped educate me and also was literally a workbook so I could do the exercises. And I forget if I did them before I worked with Beverly or after, but it, it was a, those things combined were big helps to me, especially that workbook. Very good. Well, your words are, are surely a source of strength and wisdom for others. Thanks. Being able to, to share your story. I know for most of us it's very difficult to share our story because there's so much emotion based around it. Mm -hmm. But that's our whole mission with We Choose to Thrive is, is to let others know, just like you and me, that it takes finally recognizing that, that we're not living the lives we're meant to live. We're not living the full essence of who we are, and we can do something about it. And it's mm -hmm. time, because um, I think it was Dr. David Hawkins where he has the emotions, this emotion scale. And in his um, description of it, he has the colors of shame, anger. And on the emotional scale, it starts like sh shame and fear and all of those are like 20 30 40 then you get to courage and it's about 200 and i have this graphic of a, of a woman rising up but the courage part to make the changes is at that 200 point so you've gone from the 20 the 30 the 40 the 50 the, the shame and the guilt the fear you get to that courage and it's the hardest part and then you rise up and it goes into love and acceptance and all mm -hmm. those beautiful things that that is the essence of living a beautiful life. So on behalf of We Choose to Thrive and the Woman I Love, I thank you, Winnie, for sharing your beautiful story thank you. and your courage to say, this is the way it is. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for watching this We Choose to Thrive interview. If you are currently in an abusive situation, please seek help immediately. Our purpose in creating this book and video series is to form a sisterhood of support. Know that abuse is abuse no matter what kind it is. The stories in this We Choose to Thrive series are as many and varied as the people in it. If this resonates with you, we welcome you and invite you to join us. If you know someone who would benefit from hearing this interview, please feel free to share.